Okay. So I'm going to try not to go full screen because I know how to write in multiple colors if I can do it that way, uh, which I'm going to want to do today. All right, so we've talked about this idea. If it's a problem may not be in full screen out there, hopefully just let me know and I'll, I'll change it, but I want to try not to be. Um, is that okay? In this? It looks good. Okay. Yeah, I'm good here. All right, good. All right, well, so... We talked about the idea of filtering. So basically this is, this is sort of the concept, right? So what we say is we look at a circuit and we get its transfer function. Usually we write that in terms of H of S, right? And we've talked about the fact that capacitors have an impedance, inductors have an impedance. It's the same as when we were doing impedance before. If I have a capacitor, what's the capacitor impedance now in terms of Laplace? How do we? One, One over SC. Yeah, one over SC, SL for an inductor, all that sort of stuff. So this example I said is if, let's say I put in a cosine that has a frequency of 10 radians per second and the circuit has a transfer function whose magnitude at that frequency is 0 0.707 and whose angle is negative 45 degrees. Well, what does this tell me here? If I know this information about the transfer function, what do I do with that? What's the, what, what's the point of knowing that? You were just supposed to calculate the output? Yeah, so it tells me how much bigger or smaller the output's gonna be at that same frequency and how much shifted it's gonna be, okay? And the, the reason for this typically for understanding this stuff is oftentimes we talk about these, these ideas of low pass filters, band pass filters, high pass filters, Right to say that something passes something. So if it's if it's a low pass filter, what does that mean to say that it's a low pass filter? High frequencies aren't going to be passed. High frequencies will not pass. Yeah, low frequencies will pass. You're a negative guy. Yeah. So low 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 frequencies low frequencies pass. High frequencies don't pass. High frequencies. What's the term we use for for when they don't pass? What are we doing to them? Attenuated. Yes, we attenuate them. All right. Ideally, it would be like what I got right here and I would re reject them. I would multiply them by zero and just make them go away. But like we said, that's not possible. So this guy here is a real low pass filter where I see that he kind of rolls off gently. As frequency increases, the magnitude rolls off. So I can't really ever make anything go to zero, but I can make it get smaller. I can attenuate it. And, you know, these ideas are, are helpful to us because oftentimes when you're designing, right, most of the time in the real world, your boss is never gonna give you a circuit and say, analyze that circuit for me. Tell me what the currents are everywhere, right? What, what, you need to, what you need to do typically is you'll say, okay, well, I know I've got noise at a certain frequency. Design a filter that makes that noise much, much smaller, okay? So that's, that's the sort of the, the places where we apply this. All right, so we, we did a, an example the other day right, where I talked about this, I said, well, I gave an example filter from my, my PV inverter problem and we looked at this guy. So the transfer function looked like this. And I see that at one point, this guy has a magnitude that is seven times 10 to the fourth. And everywhere else, it looks basically zero. What's the, what's the problem with this graph? Well, it's not actually zero anywhere, right? So, so what do we try to do to sort of expand that y-axis a little bit better. You converted everything in terms of logs. Converted everything in terms of logs. So I gave this example, right, where we said, all right, so if I had a number, if I take the numbers from 10,000 to 0 0.001. So we're going through seven orders of magnitude. All right, that's a pretty big change. If I take the log of those numbers, I'm only going from four to negative three. So I'm only going basic, I'm only traveling seven integers instead of seven orders of magnitude, right? Seven orders of magnitude is a big distance, right? And so the graph on the left here is that original graph. The graph on the right is if I look at this in terms of the log. And I said, you know, not by my choice, but by the choice of engineers the world over, right? Back to some guy in Bell Labs in the 20s is we look at 20 times the log, okay? And we call that, we give that the unit of decibels, all right? And the bell is after Alexander Graham Bell, all right? Decibels are, are what we call them, okay?
Okay, so we called these things Bode plots, and what we what we said was we plot them on a log log scale, meaning that the x-axis we plot the log of frequency, and on the y-axis we plot the log of the magnitude. Okay, this plot's really easy to make in MATLAB. All right, we'll talk about how to make it in MATLAB. We're gonna talk about how to make it by hand too. Right? You guys are going to have to demonstrate that you can make it by hand. If you look at the problems on the homework, I think it's four, five, and six, I tell you to make the plots by hand, but you're on the honor system there. You don't have to submit anything for it. Okay. What I do ask you to do is to tell me some of the things that are some of the characteristics of that plot. So tell me its slopes and tell me some things like that. All right. So we'll, we'll, we'll see more about what that means as we go through more examples today. All right. So... The thing we said last time is said, all right, well, so if I look at this graph here on the right, if I ask you what's the magnitude, let's say, so this guy starts at 10 to the third radians per second, right? So if I need to make that a little bit bigger, right? So 10 to the third radians per second to 10 to the sixth radians per second is the range of frequencies there. Let's say I asked you, okay, what's the magnitude of that thing at 10 to the third radians per second? Zero. Zero. Appears to be zero. Zero dB, right, is what it is, right? And so if I look at this, so this is 20 times the log of the magnitude. So what you would say is at this point here at 10 to the third, I would have 20 log base 10 of H of J 10 to the third is equal to zero dB. So how do I figure out the actual magnitude at that point? Do you divide by the 20 log 10? Can you do that? Well, I divide by 20, right? Oh. I can say log 10 H J 1000. Let's just do it as 1000. So zero divided by 20 is still zero, right? And then how do I undo the logarithm thing here? Yeah. Exp Exponential, right? Raise each side to the power of 10. So you do basically you do 10 to the log and 10 to the zero. What's 10 to the zero? One. One. Right. So basically what we get from this, right over here, that the magnitude of H at J 1000 is one. Okay. So what does it mean to say the magnitude's one? Good question. The output hasn't changed at all? The output hasn't changed at all in terms of the fact that it's amplitude, amplitude of the input and amplitude of the output are the same. So if I was putting in a one volt peak to peak sine wave into this circuit that has this transfer function, what would be the magnitude of the output? One volt peak to peak. One volt peak to peak, okay. So that's, that's, how we, that's how we do that. So if I have a dB value lower than zero, that's when I'm attenuating. A dB value bigger than zero, we say we have what we call gain. All right, we have what we call gain. So over here at this point, I got a lot of gain, which means what? Well, it means the output's bigger than the input, okay? So you can do that. You can have an output bigger than the input, all right? Um, there's limitations on what can happen there. But, but output can be bigger than the input. All right, that's when we were making amplifiers. All right, questions about the basic idea there? Would you mind explaining one more time why we do it in decibels? Like, why are we measuring the y-axis in the unit decibel? Well, so, so it was given that name long ago at Bell Labs, basically. I mean, so lo the log of the magnitude is, is called a decibel. Um, and, and specifically 20 times the log is, is called a decibel. Okay. It All is right. a tenth of a bell, if that means anything to you. Uh, like, am I wrong in assuming like, when I think decibels, isn't that what they measure like it is. sound? It is, and so, so sound is measured in decibels. Like, you know, so when, when I'm, hey, over there, I'm like, little decibels and then rocket launch is like a hundred decibels. So sound power is, is measured logarithmically, right? So, so what, what that sort of says is the power of a sound wave um, when I'm whispering versus a rocket launch is so many orders of magnitude different that somebody decided, well, if we look at it on a log scale, 
it becomes a little, it becomes more manageable. Like a rocket launch is probably like 120 decibels and me speaking is probably like one decibel. But 100 decibels versus one decibel is, I don't know, if, if I go from zero to 100, 100 would be, so zero is a, mag, so zero is a magnitude of one. 100 would be uh, 10 to the 100 over 20. So 100 divided by 20 is five, 10 to the fifth, right? So 10 to the fifth is 100,000. So basically what it says is a rocket launch would be 100,000 times larger than, than me. So it's hard, to vis it's hard to put those on the same scale. So, that's, it's, so things, that, things that are hard to visualize on a scale like that are, are sometimes put on a logarithmic scale. So, so think of it like this. So he's asking the question. So what I have is basically log 10 of X equals zero. Let's do it that way, right? So, so basically if I do 10, 10 to the log X equals 10 to the zero, I did the same operation to both sides as kosher, right? So when you take 10 to the log X, it becomes X equals 10 to the zero, right? So that's back in the bowels of your algebra two brain. Yeah. It's, it's been a minute probably since you thought about logs, I suspect, yeah. So this little diagram right here, mm -hmm. what is it, uh, I guess like, say you're doing a What is it? What does it represent? Uh, that's a good question, yeah. So it's like, it so it's, peaks at one point and then everything else just goes to zero. So is that just like a fast filter? Well, so what the, why, I, so question, I would call this guy a low pass filter here. All right. And, and the uh, reason I would call this a low pass filter is because the magnitude is, is zero dB or one at low frequencies. So that means I'm passing, right? So input equals output. Once I get to a really high frequency, I see the magnitude is dropping. So let's say, let's say I'm looking here at 10 to the sixth. All right. I'm a little bit less than minus 50, but let's call it minus 50, all right? So that would be 10 to the minus 50 over 20, all right? So what is that equal to in terms of magnitude? I'll ask MATLAB. Um, it's a small number. So 10 to the minus 50 over 20. Oops. And there's a three, two. Yeah, so about about 0 0.0032. So that what that says is if I had an input at 10 to the sixth radians per second, the output would be 0 0.0032 times that input. So one volt peak to peak in would become 3.2 millivolts peak to peak out. So that's a high pass filter, right? Now this guy is weird in the fact that he's got this little notch up here that's, that says, if I put an input in at this particular frequency, I can get a gigantic output. All right, this is called a resonance circuit. It's got something called a resonance where there's, it's got a little sweet spot where if you tickle it at the sweet spot, it goes insane. Um, that's, we're, we're not gonna deal with that phenomenon too much, right? What I'm looking at here primarily is what I would call a low pass filter. You guys will have low pass, high pass, band pass, basically what you see, okay? Is that peak also the breakpoint frequency? We'll talk about that, but yes, it is sort of the breakpoint frequency, yeah. Okay. Because okay. it, it related to my lab, they wanted us to find the breakpoints from. Yeah, the, the breakpoint is where are the points where it changes. So we're gonna talk. Let's let's get into our examples here because that's the key thing for us today is to get into some examples. Uh, so the lab has you doing that this week. Yep, we're building a simple RC, uh, RC circuit and determining whether it's a high pass or low pass filter. Okay. Wow, we aligned with the labs. That's magical. Yeah. All right. That's unusual. Okay, good though, it's good. Um, I wish we, we did that more. All right, so in general, we're gonna look at our circuits and we're gonna get these transfer functions that have a shape like this. All right, so they're gonna be in terms of S, it's gonna look like this whole thing. Um, so this guy is, is ugly looking. That's my general form of this whole thing, right? So basically what I say is the multiplier in front of this guy, there is this, 
S term right here. And then there's S terms on the top and S terms on the bottom. So what did I call, so a value of S that makes the numerator equal to zero, what do we call that? A zero. A zero. zero, yeah. And it's a pole if it's on the bottom. Now at a pole, why do I call it a pole again? The function shoots up to infinity. Yeah, the function shoots up to infinity. So it's, it's you know, it's basically a big pole, right? And then I have this, these S terms that have nothing else going with them. Those are poles or zeros at the origin, okay? So um, what we were trying to work, work through on Friday is, well, how do I plot that Bode plot for these things? So, so I took the example of, let's say I had a, a single pole filter, all right? So an RC circuit, in this particular case, I had an RC circuit with a particular R and C value and it had the transfer function I've got written here, all right? And so what we do is we say, all right, well, when we're doing the Bode plot, we're assuming we're talking about sinusoidal signals. So I plug in S equal to J omega, right? So I'm basically back to looking at impedance stuff. All right, <clears throat> so this guy has a single pole. Now what I did was I said, well, okay, just to, just to make sure we follow what I did here, I gotta get the magnitude of that thing. So how do I get the magnitude of this? What I've written there. Magnitude of top divided by magnitude of bottom. Yeah, magnitude of the top divided by magnitude of the bottom. So I say the magnitude of H of J omega. And the thing to remember is this guy is a function of omega, right? Omega is an independent variable and I plot the dependent variable, the magnitude. All right, so that's, what's the magnitude of the top for that guy? One. One, all right, that's a good one, right? What's the magnitude of the bottom? Square root of something, right? Real part plus imaginary part squared, right? What's the real part? Omega 0 0.001 squared plus one squared. Yeah, all right. So I'm gonna say, it, yeah, and my, my, this tau p, this multiplier here in this case is 0.001. I'm gonna just call it tau p though, like that. Does the j factor into the imaginary part? No. No, the j is a multiplier on the imaginary part, all right? So, that's my magnitude. What we did here is we took 20 log of both sides and it becomes that, okay? And so in this particular case, log of one is always what? Zero. Zero, right? So basically this whole guy collapses down into this. All right, so what I did last time was I, what did we say on Friday? How do I look at that thing? I can find it. Which one? Do what? You can look compare at the, the omega tau with one. Yes, compare the omega tau with one. So we basically did this sort of caveman kind of thing. I said, well, what happens if, if, if omega tau p is much, much less than one, which corresponds to frequencies much, much less than the pole frequency, okay? What we said in that particular case, if, if one is a much bigger number than omega tau p, then we just ignore the omega tau p coming out of this thing, okay? You basically have one plus little number. One plus little number equals one, right? The other case we had was one plus big number, right? That's over here. Is this just like a very, very simple way of doing things? <clears throat> yeah, okay. engineers are simple people, okay. right? As much as I, that's what I was trying to say, as much as, as the math, it seems like we love math, we actually don't try to get away from it as much as possible, believe it or not, all right? So what, what I'm doing, yeah, is basically I'm trying to say, well, if, if, if omega, ultimately what this says on the left is it says if the frequency is low, what happens? On the right, it says if the frequency is high. And our determination of what's low and high changes based on where the pole is located. All right, so what we said last time is this particular example I gave, the pole is located at one over 0 0.001. So one over 0 0.001, what frequency is that? One over 10 to the minus three. Is it a thousand? A thousand, a thousand 10 to the third. So that says that our, our pole breakpoint, 
So you used the term there a few minutes ago, Christian, of this break point. What that pole is, is the break point where our graph changes, all right? It's the point at which we say anything below that frequency, I'm going to consider a low frequency. Anything above that frequency, I'm going to consider a high frequency. And so when we looked at this sort of result here, what we said is at low frequencies, below that break point, the magnitude simplifies down to 20 log of one, which is zero. So for low frequencies, the value of this thing is zero, which basically means for any frequency, the value is zero. So I say it's constant and it's flat, right? That was basically the section that I'm looking at right here, right up into a thousand. And then beyond a thousand, what we said is those are the high frequencies. And we did some analysis and we basically said that we got this guy here, 20 log of the magnitude is equal to negative 20 log of omega, right? So what I said with that is if I think of that like this, 20 log 10 of the magnitude is equal to negative 20 log 10 of omega. It's like if this is my y-axis variable, this is my x-axis variable. So this is like looking at negative 20x. If I had y equals negative 20x, what kind of graph is that? What would I call that? Linear. It's linear. linear. It's a line, right? It's a, it's a linear function. So what I have is basically after a thousand radians per second, this guy falls, all right? Which says that he's beginning his attenuation, right? So <clears throat> this guy has a slope, he falls at a rate of negative 20. And we give that guy units of negative 20 decibels per decade, okay? The term I used Friday was, I, I said a factor of 10 in frequency is a decade. So basically we look at this as I fell, as I go from a thousand to 10,000, I fell 20 dB. As I went from 10,000 to 100,000, I went from negative 20 to negative 40. So every one of those is a fact. So every factor of 10 in frequency, I go, I, I drop another 20 decibels, all right? Which is a factor of 10 in magnitude, if, if you're thinking about it hard, but don't, don't think about it too hard. Important thing to remember, Basically, what we came down to is if I have a pole, for frequencies below the pole, the magnitude is flat. For frequencies greater than the pole, the magnitude is dropping at negative 20 dB per decade. All right, very simple rule. Below that frequency, which we call the break point, we call that the break point of the graph because the graph is going to break a certain direction at that point. All right. So what we're saying is there's a break point at the pole, right? And that break point basically says below that it's flat, above that it's falling, okay? So what we, we did is, well, you know, so the only difference would be if I, had a, if I had a zero rather than a pole, what would be the only difference to this? The analysis would be the same, be the reverse, It'd be flat. And then after the pole frequency, what would it do? It would go up by 20. It would go up. 20 dB per decade, okay? I guess we should be glad that decade doesn't actually mean years. <laughs> yeah. So well, at what point does this circuit reach this magnitude? I don't know. What do you say we pick this up in 20 years? Yeah, I'll see you there. <laughs> yeah, De decade has two meanings, I guess, in that context, yeah. All right, so, so yeah, so basically it, it either rises, it, if it is zero, it rises, pole falls, okay? Now, question? There. Dimensions of the graph are always going to be like this, yeah. So I put this on, on what I call log log paper, right? Um, and, you know, if you look at it, there's a, so there's a linear spacing between 0 0.1 and 1 in between one and 10 and 10 and 100 and 100 and 1,000 and 1,000 and 10,000. Because I'm looking at minus, so like I showed here, right? At omega equals 0 0.1 on the log scale is at negative one. One is at zero on the log scale. 10 is at one on the log scale. 
right? So basically, remember, I'm taking that those magnitudes, orders of magnitude, and I'm shrinking down so they're linear, they're linearly separated from each other, integerly separated from each other. I think I made that word up. Okay. All right, that was one key result. The other key result we came to is we said, well, it may suck, but that's what we get, right? If I take the magnitude of the whole shebang, all right, then what I do is I take the magnitude. It's not too bad because if I, if I have complex numbers, if I have two complex numbers and multiply them out and I say, what's the magnitude of a product of complex numbers? What is the magnitude of a product of complex numbers? So I take the, I take the product of the magnitudes. So the magnitude of one times the magnitude of the other, and I would do it the way you way you suggested it, right? So I just like I have here, if I have this this guy, the magnitude becomes like this, and then what I do is I have to put in all the square roots and all that stuff. But if I look at this, the beautiful thing about it, if, if you can call it beautiful, I guess, is if I take the log of both sides, right? What happens when I take the log of a product? The sum of the logs, you can right? Add them. Yeah, you get the sum of the logs, you add them, right? So what we say is when I have this ugly thing, if I know that it consists of a bunch of pole terms and a bunch of zero terms, what does this mean for me in terms of how I make the graph at this point? We didn't quite get to that on I mean, multiple, multiple parts. Yeah, I add up the multiple, I do each one part by part and then I add them up together to get the total graph, okay? I will have multiple parts going up and down and I combine them. It turns out this sounds complicated, but once you start to see the examples, like, oh, this actually gets pretty easy. All right, it's a lot easier than other stuff that we've done. But looks, you start looking at the math and you're like, oh shit, All right? There's a lot of math going on here, but it's gonna, it's gonna get a lot better. Watch my mouth. This is going on YouTube. I'm used to record. The, uh, ocean moment. <laughs> yeah. Watch. You can only demonetize if you say something within the first three minutes. So you're probably good. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, what does that capital N mean in that formula? Well, it says that I could have n poles or zeros at the origin. So I could have one. I could have two. I could have many of them. Is a total number of poles or zeros at the origin. All right. So a couple of things with this. So if, if I, let's say I had this multiple, we're going to look at some examples. The best thing is going to be examples rather than to get focused on the derivation, right? If, if I look at 20 log K, what's that do? What, what does that look like versus frequency? 20 log of a constant. If I plotted that guy versus frequency, what would that look like? Wouldn't that just be a line? It would, just, it would just be a flat line. It, where it sits depends on what the constant is, but it's just another constant. It's the log of a, the log of a constant is another constant, right? So what's that gonna do? That's gonna take the graph of everything and shift it up or down a little bit, okay? Now, if I have a pole or a zero at the origin, the magnitude of J omega is what? What's the magnitude of J omega? Zero. No. <laughs> As a function of frequency, what is it? Omega, right? Square root of the imaginary part squared plus the real part squared, right? Would be omega squared plus zero squared square root, right? That's just omega. If I take 20 log of that thing, it's, if it's a pole, then it falls always. It's gonna have a slope of negative 20 dB per decade. And if, I, if it's a zero, it rises at 20 dB per decade, okay? And where is omega equal to zero on this logarithmic scale here? Not the origins, way far from the origin, right? Where is omega equal to zero on a log scale? Is it not just at zero? It's at negative infinity. Right? So if I had, right, think about this. Let's, let's say I had the number 10 to the minus 17, right? That's a small number, right? 
well, I don't need the 20. Well, let's say I had 10 to the minus 17. That's a really small frequency. That probably is decades of frequency, right? So what is that equal to? Minus, really 17. Small number. minus 17. Well, 20, it's not, that's the thing. It's not a small number, right? 20 log of minus 17 is minus 17. If I had, if I had a really tiny number, let's say 10 to the minus a million, that would be a what's million. that equal to? Million. Negative a million. Where's zero? The log of zero is where? It doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. You can't raise any exponent to a power and get zero. I can't, but, but that, that says that in the limit, as I approach zero, where would it be? I was hoping where? Increasing infinity. Negative infinity. Negative infinity. Negative infinity, right? So when I had 10 to the minus 17, which is incredibly close to zero, that was at negative 17. If I had 10 to the minus 1 million, that was at negative 1 million. As I get closer and closer and closer and closer to omega equal to zero, I'm shooting way off onto the, on the, on the log axis. I'm going off to negative infinity, right? So basically... If you think about where the, the a pole or a, or a zero at zero, well, their pole or zero happened way off at negative infinity on this log scale. So one thing you're going to notice as I draw my graphs here is I usually draw the intersection of the axes where it's zero on the linear scale, which would be at one, right? One radian per second. The log of one is what? Zero. So I almost always draw it with the crossing happening right there. So it's zero dB on the y-axis and it's at one on the logarithm on the on the omega axis. All right, because the log of one is zero. Okay. On a test, I would give you the axes already labeled up so you don't have to worry about that. Okay. All right. So where we ended on Friday is we talked about a process for this. And I give you a five-step process. So first is I got to get the pole in zero locations. There might be a step zero, right? Which is a, you basically solve, get the transfer function from the circuit. Look at the circuit, get the transfer function, right? Once I have the transfer function, what I have to do is determine the pole in zero locations. Basically, what are the values of S that make that transfer function equal to infinity? or zero. From those, I created this step 1a, which is basically to say, go from the pole in zero locations, which are s values, to corresponding omega values, what I call the breakpoints. So Christian, what you were referring to there is breakpoints. Those are basically the frequencies that kind of correspond to my poles and zeros. So multiple breakpoints could be possible. Just multiple breakpoints could be possible. In fact, you're almost always going to have multiple breakpoints. Okay. Okay. Um, so I place the transfer function step two into the correct form. All right? In other words, I have to get into this form. Oftentimes it's not going to be in that form. The key thing about that form is uh, if I look at this is I always have S times a tau plus one. So I always have something times S plus one, something times S plus one. And I, and I got to get it factored in this form. All right. What I then do th steps three and four are the key ones, right? I generate a plot for each individual pole and zero going from left to right on the frequency axis. Then I add them up. I add up the results of every single one of them and draw the complete magnitude plot. And then what I do is if I have a multiplier, I shift it all up or down at the end. And it's really easy to verify if you're right by checking with MATLAB, all right? And we're gonna see how to do this in MATLAB, all right? so. I almost am at a point in, in reality where I don't even know that it's all that valuable for you guys to know how to make them by hand. I think it's important only because you need to know what's a break point, right? The question, Christian, that you just asked. I need to know this idea of if I have a pole, then things fall at negative 20 dB per decade. I, there's certain things that I think you need to know, but you should, this is, this is a key point. If I give you a transfer function on the test, you should all get 100 on it because you could plot it in MATLAB, all right? I'll know if you just did it in MATLAB because there's an approximation 
and there's a real graph. There's an approximate graph and a real graph, and they're a little bit different, all right, but they're pretty close, all right? But you should be able to get the problems right because MATLAB's there, and we'll look at how to enter it into MATLAB, okay? All right, so example time, all right? So here's a transfer function, came from a circuit, all right? H of S equals S over 10 times S plus 10 to the fifth, okay? So I'm gonna do my step two first, I guess, because I want it, that's not, that is not in my standard form, is it? This is my standard form. This guy is not in my standard form. I guess I don't need to do that yet. I'm not gonna do it yet, actually. Let me jump to this, all right? Where does that guy have poles? And zeros. All right. Well, give me so somebody online. Where's my zero at? Zero. Okay. I got a zero at zero, and so I, what I do is I, I I put that guy right there. So I make this what I call pole zero plot, and I say, well, I got a zero right there at the origin, and I draw a zero by making a O. Zero O, right? So what about the uh, the pole. What's the value of the pole here? Negative 10 to the Specifically, S equal to, to, I hear 10 to the fifth, but not, not quite 10 to the fifth. Negative, right? 10, negative, to the negative fifth. 10 to the fifth and zero. Negative 10 to the fifth is where my pole is. Okay. So that's over here, negative 10 to the fifth. Because the value of S that makes that guy equal to, to zero is negative 10 to the fifth. Okay. Now, once I plug in frequency and I start making plots of frequencies, well, the, the real impacts happen at the positive frequencies. So the break points, so if I have these poles, okay, and zeros, then I get break points, right? The break points I have according, representing the zero, I'm gonna get one at zero radians per second. And the pole causes one at 10 to the fifth radians per second. All right, the important thing is here is we use these terms kind of interchangeably, but the pole is a point that happens at a negative number, but the break point happens at a positive frequency. All right, you can look carefully at the derivation of the, of the math on this, right? But it is clearly a negative value coming out of this transfer function for S, right? But it will, its impact will be manifested at positive frequencies when I, because I'm only putting positive frequencies usually into, into circuits. Okay, so I'm, I map the poles to breakpoints. Okay, and then, all right, I wanna get this guy in my standard form. Okay, now the reason I, I, reason I figure out the breakpoints, a couple of reasons is at, at breakpoints, interesting things should happen. The graphs basically change at the breakpoints. All right, that's an important thing to bear in mind. Once we know the breakpoints, once we draw the graph, things happen at the breakpoints. Transitions happen. All right, so this guy here, I wanna get him in that standard form, S over 10 times S plus 10 to the fifth. Well, the standard form is up above me there. How do I, what do, how do I get this into standard form? So you need to take the magnitude, right? Well, 10 to the fifth factor out a 10 to the fifth, all right? Turns out I don't need to do any taking of the magnitudes, all right? I know what happens if I take the magnitude here. So I'm not gonna have to, I'm just gonna use the result, okay? The one thing I have to do to get these guys in, this, in the same form is to factor out a 10 to the fifth from the bottom term, because here I have an S plus something, right? Whereas up here I have S times something plus one, all right? so. Like Tone said, I want to factor out a 10 to the fifth. So I have 10 times 10 to the fifth. And what does that do to this guy over here? S over 10 to the fifth plus one. Yeah, S over 10 to the fifth plus one. Like that. Okay. All right. So when I look at this thing, I can write this now as K S over S tau P one 
plus one. That is that guy in standard form. Now, what I want you guys to do is help me out. What is K and what is tau P? K is, is one over 10 to the sixth. K is one over 10 to the sixth, right? Which is a tiny number or, you know, 10 to the minus six. Okay. What is tau P one? One over 10 to the fifth. Yeah, one over 10 to the fifth or 10 to the minus fifth. All right, it's the inverse of the breakpoint frequency. That's where it is, okay. All right, so now I go on to my step three. What was step three? Well, step three was to generate a plot for each individual pole and zero moving left to right on the frequency axis, okay? So let's, let's go one by one, all right? So how many things, how many poles and zeros do I have here? Two. One pole, one zero. So two. Yeah. So let's let's do the pole first. Where is that pole? What's the breakpoint frequency that goes with that pole? Ten to the fifth. Ten to the fifth. And what did I say we do? Moving left to right. What do we do if we have a pole? It drops. Well, it's going to be zero until you get to the breakpoint, and then the magnitude is zero until I get to the breakpoint, and then it starts to change. All right, and then it starts to drop. So here's what we're gonna do. Before I get too far, I gotta dimension my axes here, okay? So I wanna make sure we're, we're on the same page and we're tracking with this, right? So what I have is on the log log paper here, I said I usually, I usually put the axes here so that this point is on the x-axis one radian per second. All right, so why, why the origin right there? What's 20 log of one? Zero. Is zero, right? Or I said log of one is zero. So this guy here, so a decade before that, what frequency is that? 10 to the negative one. Okay. This guy would be 10. This guy would be 100. This guy would be 1,000. This guy would be 10 to the fourth. This guy would be 10 to the fifth. This guy would be 10 to the sixth, and that point would be 10 to the seventh. Okay. All right, so let's do our poll first. So let's see, so we do colors here. So we're gonna do our poll. So our poll has a break point at 10 to the fifth rad per second, All right? This is our pole. All right, so how do I do that? So Steven said it earlier, you right? Go all the way to the 10 to the fifth with a zero and then you go up by 20. Uh, yep, so right. basically it's flat here. So it's flat at zero dB out to 10 to the fifth, like that, okay? And then at 10 to the fifth, it starts to fall at 20 dB per decade. So real quick, I didn't dimension my axis. So here's, here's negative 20, here's negative 40, negative 60, negative 80, negative 100, negative 120, and negative 140 are all those different points. So your slope always going to be either positive or negative 20? Mm -hmm. Not because of the y-axis, but because of what we derived before, right? Basically, it's just a result that, that comes out of the, pops out of the math, right? So once I, once I get to, in this case, at looking at just the, the pole, I'm flat at zero dB, and then I start to fall. So at 10 to the sixth radians per second, what should this, I don't know, that's orange, I guess? Where should the orange guy be at 10 to the sixth? Negative 20. Negative 20. By 10 to the seventh, he should be at negative 40, right? So he's going to do that. Okay. Right, but is that, is that like precise or would it vary? That is incredibly precise with the exception of what happens right near 10 to the fifth. Okay. Right. It's, it's remarkably precise otherwise, right? It, it's pretty flat at zero. And it pretty much, and it does fall at negative 20 dB per decade.
but it um, near the, near the pole frequency, near that breakpoint frequency, it is a little bit off because at that point, my approximation of well, here's what happens at low frequencies. Here's what happens at high frequencies. Well, I'm not quite at either low or high at that point, but it's still pretty darn good. Okay. So can I view the breaking point as like when our filter actually starts filtering stuff? It's, it's the part at which filtering really begins. Okay. Yeah, that's why we call it a break point. It's where some change happens. It's where the filtering happens. So if I had just this guy right here, this guy would tell me, well, it looks like I have a low pass filter that has a cutoff frequency where it begins to cut off, begins to attenuate at 10 to the fifth. Okay. <clears throat> so, so far we've only done the pole. We got to do each individual part. We got one more part to worry about here. So let's do that in another color. We'll do purple for that guy. Yeah, the break, so, so yeah, the, the break point is the absolute value of that. It's the positive, right? All right, again, you can, we can derive that. Basically, we're looking at the magnitude of, of H of J omega. Once we look at the magnitude of H of J omega, those negative pole values have impacts at positive frequencies, right? I don't want to get too lost in that math. Just basically take the minus sign off of your, of, and, and you'll feel good, all right? All right, so I'm going purple on the zero. Where is my zero located? Zero. Yeah. All right, so omega z was equal to zero. Now, where is zero on that scale? On that, on that x-axis? Negative infinity. Negative infinity, right? And so what I'm plotting with this guy is I am plotting 20 log 10 of omega. Okay, 20 log 10 of omega. Now to figure out where to place that guy, the way I always think of it is what's his slope? 20 log 10 of omega, right? What's his slope? It's positive, right? And how many dB per decade is he rising? 20. 20. 20. 20. 20. Now the question is where do I draw him on this graph? He doesn't have a break point. Per, he doesn't have a break point I can see. He's got a break point off at zero, which is somewhere, you know, over in you know, China, right? So where where is, uh, what, how would I figure out where to place that? Any thoughts? But what I do is I plug in omega equal to one, right? If I plug in omega equal to one, where will that guy be sitting? 20 log of one is what? Zero. Zero. So what I do is I draw them through here like this, right? So here's, here's omega equal to one, right? At that point, 20 log of one is zero. So this guy's sitting at zero dB. If I plug in omega equal to 10 into this, you'll see that this guy is at 20. And then... 40 and then 60 like that. Okay. All right. We're done with step three. Okay. We've plotted them both. Yeah. It's not, well, it's not necessarily a low pass filter. I, I would be clear. I, when I, if I said, if I just had something that had that pole, that would be a low pass filter. Since, since the zero is at omega equals 100, would that mean that the break point is at, the, if you have zero, DC? The, the zero is at, o, at omega equal to zero. Oh, omega equal to zero, that's what I meant, yeah. Uh, omega equal to zero, would that mean that you have, um, your break point is when you have a DC input? Because DC yeah. has omega equal to zero. It is, yeah. But yes, that's correct. You could think of it as, yeah, the break point is at DC. All right, we did, so we finished step three. Okay, what is step four? On the value of uh, the constant? Well, step four was, just, was actually to add these guys together. So move left and right, add the results from step three to get the complete plot, okay? I say moving left to right, very carefully about this. So what I say is at every frequency, let's say at 10 to the minus one, I wanna add the purple with the orange, okay? I gotta get a new color. Uh, I'm gonna get green, what do I wanna get? 
I get green thanks to that. Okay. Oops. All right. So at 10 to the minus one here at this point, I have, I'm adding them together graphically. So the orange guy is equal to zero. This guy is equal to minus 20. What is zero minus 20? Negative 20. Negative 20. What happens when I get to here? I have zero minus 10 right, or something like that. What's zero minus 10? Negative 10. Negative 10. Yeah, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna basically follow this guy and say that the summation looks like this. Now, what happens at this, at this point right here where this, this purple crosses over the orange? Now I'm adding a positive number to the orange guy. So basically I'm gonna follow this guy. Oh boy, he's gonna go way up there. He's gonna go off my axes. Um, so at 10 to the fourth, he would be at, okay, so let's see. <clears throat> at 10 to the third, this guy is equal to 60. So where would he be at 10 to the fourth? At 80. Where would he be at 10 to the fifth? 100, so he's way up there. All right, so let's remember, no oh boy, think about this. When you say orange, do you mean the yellow line? Yeah, I don't know, is that's orange or yellow? I was, amber. Mustard. It's mustard. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, it's yeah, from mustard. mustard. Yeah. All right. We'll go with we'll go with mustard. All right. So this was just to be clear. This is 100 here, and this is 80 here, and thereabouts, right? Something like that. 80 is a little bit lower. Right there. Okay. <clears throat> so. At 10 to the fifth, what happens then? This guy, the, the orange, the mustard guy starts to fall, right? They get canceled out. They cancel out. One guy's going up at 20 dB per decade, and you're adding to that something that's trying to drop at 20 dB per decade. And so as a result, the net is going to stay at 0 dB per decade. All right? And he's fine. The reason I'm asking this, I know it's a weird question, but the reason I'm asking it is because this reminds me like at the beginning of 2254 when you had to add the unit step function plus the shift. Do you know? I do, but there's no connection between those no, things. Because, okay. No, yeah, it's, you can talk about that later. Yeah, they're not okay. related. All right, so you guys follow what I did there. So what kind of filter is this? Well, I'm not done yet. I don't want to, I, we'll, we'll, get to we'll get to your question, but I'm, I got one more step left to do, right? What's my last step? Now you do the constant. Now I do the constant, all right? So shift everything up or down based on the K value. All right, so my K value was 10 to the minus six. All right, but I need to bring in the log of that. So what's 20 log? 10 of K. Negative 120. Negative 120. Okay. So basically negative six times 20, negative 120. So what does that do? Because I add that to everything else, it basically amounts to at every frequency, I add negative 120. So if I added negative 120 at every frequency, what would I do to that thing? You're shifting your graph down. Shifting it down by 120. So where I had, so now I got to do another color here. Um, pink, red, I don't know. Yeah, I'll do red. All right. So I'm going to start over here. Up, it, This guy leveled off, it looked like at 100. So if I shift 100 down negative 120, where does that go to? Negative 20. This guy's going to be flat. And then he's gonna, everything else is gonna fall. Or actually it's rising. What is this red line? That's the summation of all of them. This guy here, this is 20 log 10 of the magnitude of H of J omega, right? This, this guy here is Mr. Mustard is the pole. Uh, the zero has been covered up. 
now, but the, there was a purple zero that was going on. The green was the summation of everything before I did the shift. I'm sorry, quick question. The zero was just the line, right? There was no, it didn't. Was, yeah, the zero was the rising line uh, here. Okay, so I guess I'm just making sure I'm not confused. When it gets to 100, it continues on. It doesn't. Level. Yeah, the zero itself. Can, yeah, so if I think, well, that's a good point. So what I could do is if I talked about the zero itself, the zero was here. And it, it went beyond that like that. The green is the combination of the orange and the purple. So this is the zero. Okay. This is, which green did I use? Was this one, man. This was the pole and zero. And the red is all of them. Where did we get the, the value for our shift? The value for the shift because there was a, there was a multiplier K in front of this whole thing. Okay. All right, so looking at that red, Musa, you asked the question, what kind of filter is that? So Musa, I'll ask you, what kind of filter do you think that is based on what I drew? It looks like it might be a high pass, but it, yeah, it, it is. attenuates regardless of the frequency. It, so it's attenuating always, right? But it's attenuating a lot at low frequencies. Right. If I look at <clears throat> what magnitude do I have at omega equal to one? Well, I have negative 120 dB. You do the math on that. That's like I put a volt in. I'm getting microvolts out. Right. That's a pretty significant attenuation at that point. If I built, if this came from some circuit, what I and and I didn't like the fact that I had a negative 20 dB attenuation at high frequencies, I would put a op amp after it that had a gain of 10. And that would shift the whole thing up again. Okay. <clears throat> so hey, we, we can play we can play some games with it. But this guy is a high pass filter because what I can see is he's passing the high frequencies. Still got some attenuation, right? But he's passing the high frequencies. So I'm sorry, quick question. When when you were talking about this filter, are we going off of the red? The red is the combined. Yeah. yeah so that's so what if you look at my my labels here, hopefully it'll make this clear when you're looking at it later, is is the red is the total the orange or mustard whatever we're calling it, it's the pole the purple is the zero and the combined is the uh, the, the green is the combined pole and zero okay. but our end product is the the end product is the red and that's what tells us it's a high pass yes yes you have to look at the combined product to know that it's a high pass yeah yeah, because if you look at this, well, the zero is kind of a kind of a high pass thing, and the pole is kind of a low pass thing. Together, they 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 work together to create this this high pass filter. Yeah, we're trying to figure out how to draw that overall plot. Okay. Now, in the homework, what I ask you to do basically is to say, all right, well, draw draw the combined. Um, you know, tell me the slope at a given frequency. Tell me the magnitude at a given frequency. So you'll, so I might tell you in the homework, well, what's the slope at 10 to the third? So if I ask you, what's the slope of the overall curve at 10 to the third, what is it? 20. 20. It's a 20 dB per decade. And if I ask you, what's the slope at 10 to the sixth? Zero. It's zero, right? So I, I ask you questions like that. That's how, you know, I don't have a good way to have you enter that plot by hand. Okay. Uh -huh. how, how do you know that it follows the zero as opposed to the zero? Because I'm adding the orange and the purple together. Okay. So up until so basically up until 10 to the fifth, I'm adding zero to where that purple line is. Once I get to 10 to the fifth, I'm basically I got a, one thing's trying to push up at 10 to the at, at 20 dB per decade, one thing's trying to push down at 20 dB per decade, so the combined stays flat. So, uh, is there any significance between the 10 to the 6 and the negative 20 uh, intersection between the pole and the final, or is it just like just graph representation? There's, there's no, yeah, there's no real okay, cool. significance to that. All right, so um, here's, you know, quick summary. You can look at this, you know, before, right, is basically how to look at the, the combinations here. So, we need to know what happens for a typical pole, a typical zero, a polar zero at the origin, 
and what that constant does. Okay. And then we, we deal with that. So how to make that plot in MATLAB. I may, I may make myself a separate um, video to do that. I want to look at it. I want to look at another example. I want to keep pushing. So we got op amp example. Okay. So, all right. I, in this case, let's put a source here. Cause I think you guys will like it if I have a source instead of a, nobody ever does that. So there's V in here. I got R1, R2 and C. All right. I don't want to go through all the details of how I solve this right now, but what do I need to do to solve this? The golden rule, which is, which is basic or two golden rules, right? So that says that V, what are they? V plus equals V minus. In this case, what is that? Zero. 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 Not always, but here, because V plus is grounded, that's at zero. And the other golden rule is what? I negative equals to I positive. Yeah, I plus, I minus. Not only are they equal to each other, but what are they always equal to? Zero. 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 Now, V plus and V minus are always equal to each other, but not necessarily to zero. I plus and I minus are equal to zero. All right. So if I did that, how would I then solve to find the transfer function here in this case? So my transfer function, to be clear, H of S, my transfer function is going to be V out over V in. And I want to get that relationship. Okay. Okay. How would I do that here? Nodal. Yeah, nodal method, right? So I'll do nodal analysis. I'm gonna say I got this. I'll do it your way. You guys like to everything going out. All right, we'll do everything going out. <clears throat> How come I didn't include this current here? Yeah. It's zero, right? So I can say I got, so nodal analysis is gonna give me zero minus V in over R1. And what would I do here? Well, I would say, first of all, um, well, let's also say zero minus V out, right? That's for the, for the branch in the, in the feedback here. Okay. And how would I write that? I got two currents there, don't I? What are they? You could just find the equivalent. Yeah, so what I would do is say my R2 and my C are in parallel. They have the same voltage across them, right? So I would say my R2 and my one over SC in parallel with each other, all right? Now, the reason I, I didn't do it that way is, is I wanted to, um, so I, I know ultimately what that, gives me when I, when I do that, right? This guy works out to be, when I'm done, V out equals R, negative R2 over R1 times one over SC R2 plus one, all right? If I do that whole analysis, that's guy at times V in, right? You're gonna get that. So what's the transfer function? On the other side, yeah, divide both sides by V in, right? And I'm going to get that my H of S, I'll write it over here. My H of S is negative R2 over R1 times 1 over SC R2 plus 1. Okay. Now, based on the numbers I have right there, if you plug in the numbers, I got R1 is 1K, R2 is 100K, right? This guy is basically going to become negative 100. And then I have this. What do I have there? I got a one microfarad capacitor. You plug in those numbers and you're going to get negative 100 divided by S10. Or I'll do it 10S plus one. 10S plus one. Like that. Okay. I plugged in the resistor values and capacitor values. So, all right, how many zeros this guy have? None, right? No. So it's got no zero, so none. All right, how many poles? One. One. 
And where is it? At negative one ten. At well, yeah, so so s, so we would say 10 s plus one equals zero, right? So s equals, uh, I need to be careful. Actually, I should have written 10, I should have written 10 to the minus one s. Something didn't seem right to me. 10 to the minus one s if I plug in those values, all right? 10 to the negative one s means that my pole is where? Negative 10. All right, so this guy's got a pole here at negative 10. All right. And then that guy, if I think about this, oops, I just copied this straight over. So he's got no zeros. Oops. So my pole is at negative 10 and then no zeros. So where's my breakpoints for this guy? At 10, it's got a pole breakpoint, right? 10 rad per second, rads per second, and no zeros. Okay. Now, is that guy in my standard form, right? I said, this is my standard form. This guy actually already came in my standard form, didn't he? Usually when you analyze from circuits, usually it comes straight out in your standard form, okay? So if I look at this guy, my transfer function is H of S equal to negative 100 over 10 to the minus one S plus one, okay? So let's look at this guy. K is what? Negative 100. Negative 100, okay? And I've got, everything else is, is okay. So one thing I got to remind myself of, when I plot the magnitude, I plot the magnitude of the whole thing. What's the magnitude of K? Just 100. It's just 100, right? So this guy becomes 20 log 10 of 100, right? What's that going to become? Four. Well, no, 40. 40, sorry. Yeah, 40. Four. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, now you got that the right idea. There. Right idea. 40, 40 dB. Okay. Now, this guy has one pole. Right? So for that one pole, what do I draw? Now, let's dimension my axes up here real quick. So I said right here, I put omega equal to one. All right? That's my origin. So what frequency do I have a decade before that? Negative 10 to the minus one. So 0 0.1. Here would be 10, here's 100, here's 1,000, here's 10,000. I can keep going if I want to, right? Here's negative 20, here's negative 40, here's negative 60, here's negative 80, like that, all right? So what do I do here? I only have one pole to worry about, right? So what do I do with my pole? How do I approach the pole? So step three is to generate a plot for each individual one, All right? So what am I drawing a plot for? Yeah, I'm gonna draw a straight line up, up until the pole, up until 10. And then he's gonna drop down at 20 dB per decade, like that, okay? Now, <clears throat> that's the summation of everything in this case. Right, I don't have any zeros to worry about. So I got to jump ahead to my step five, which is basically to take into account that K value. So what do I do with that? Shift it down. Shift it, well, in this case, not down. Up, 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 up. up. And up by how much? 40. 40. 40. So what I do is I take the whole thing and shift it up by 40. So in this case, I'm gonna shift, I'm gonna do this guy again in red, I guess. Right, so I'm gonna shift the whole thing up by, in, by 40. So basically that means I'm gonna to go to here, get to 10, and I'm gonna to start to fall at 20 dB per decade. So this guy is 20 log 10 of the magnitude of H of J omega like that, right? 
So basically what I do is I look at each of the individual pieces and then just kind of keep adding them up one at a time, right? That's the basic idea of how we approach this. Okay, so Wednesday we'll do, we'll do more examples, all right? But it's a pretty straightforward process. Okay, and I will, um, I'll post a, an extra video showing how to do it in MATLAB. It's, it's very simple to do it. What you do is you figure out how do I take that transfer function and tell MATLAB to put to, to deal with that transfer function. And then and then MATLAB has a command called Bodhi, which generates this plot. Right? And it makes the plot for you. Okay. And we'll, is PowerPoint on Canvas? Uh, it will be. I'll I'll have this up in the next hour probably. Okay, thanks.